Hi folks, Roach here. This video, Divine Law and the Holy Grail, was a series of eight videos. Uh, they were my, my first compilation on YouTube ever, and it was done in 2009. Um, so about ten years ago I, I started working on this. So I decided, um, you know, at the time, YouTube would only give me about 10 minutes. Um, I lost the original, uh, the original files. It's on a hard drive somewhere. Um, I re-downloaded the videos, and I decided to put them all together into one, one video. Uh, none of these videos uh, ever broke 10,000 views. Um, and at that point, um, there was a lot that I didn't know. I hadn't really learned and plumbed yet. So I... Um, the terminology that I use is different from what I use today. Uh, I also learned a lot more about the ego process than, than I knew at that time. Uh, quite frankly, the, the complete revision of the process. Uh, but that, at that time, I was still pretty naive. I thought, well, you know, if I just come up with a video that has, you know, the actual secret to the Holy Grail in it and the, and, and the law and the, and the uh, you know, the things that you need to understand that, you know, I could just produce that and, you know, people just snap on all over the world. <laughs> Um, it, it, it took several years, and uh, you, you know, it wasn't that I was disappointed, it was uh, that I was actually surprised that uh, people couldn't get to, uh, you know, get to the information. Uh, I, I, you know, at, at some point I thought, well, you know, maybe YouTube is filtering it out, but, you know, there's other processes at work, too. I mean, you don't get this information until you're ready for it. Uh, and I, you, know, you can say you're ready, uh, but until you're ready, but you, you don't find the video. So, you know, over the years, there's some comments. I'm going to leave the original videos out there. Uh, one of the things that I found, too, that even though they were part of a playlist, um, they wouldn't play in order. Okay, so, you know, people get lost, and they couldn't find all of it, so they, they'd watch a few of them. So, this is a long time coming. All right, so I put all these videos, uh, they come in eight parts. Uh, I'm going to leave the little transitions uh, at the end of each one of the videos uh, so that, uh, you know, people still have the feeling for the old video. Um, it wasn't as useful as the Cheat Sheet Mark V and the iterations of the Cheat Sheet. Um, just simply watching the video isn't enough to, to do that old ego head fake thing that has to happen. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there is some per, uh, uh, that there isn't some very important revelatory information in here. Uh, I mean, there there are some mind blowing components if you can get through it. And I think it'd be a lot easier if it wasn't like broken up into little you know ten and eight minute segments. Uh, so you know you can just let it run. Now it's fairly in. Uh, uh, um, you know, instructional, and, you know, I, I do a lot of reading, and, you know, there, there are a few problems with it, but all in all, I, I believe people can really navigate it. I mean, if, if it actually prompts you to, you'll want to ask questions, you know, let me know. I, you know, you know, if, if you want to yell at me, you know, you know I'll, I'll listen to that also. Um, you know, just no death threats, you know. <laughs> so, uh, well, it depends on how good the death threat is. I mean, you know, I do have a sense of humor, uh, as long as you're creative, you know. So, uh, I, you know, let's get to it. Uh, I, 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 hopefully, you'll enjoy it. Uh, again, this was th this was my first effort into uh, into truly learning uh, why was it that that people just couldn't get there. So, <laughs> I, I learned I learned a lot of it and a lot from it, and uh, I've watched it several times myself. And you might be surprised that I learn a lot from my own videos. Um, and it's just a little bit odd. People don't really understand, uh, you know, some of the way that, that I do these videos. Um, I don't have to think about what it is that I say. Um, that, that's a process. Uh, so a lot of the times, uh, while I'm doing the videos, I don't even know what it is that I'm saying. Uh, so then when I go back and I watch these videos, I mean... I'm with you. I am sitting here learning things that are completely new, even though that it might have been my mouth that said it. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm any less a student than anybody else. 
so the material itself has a mind of its own. Um, it has its own sense of timing. And, uh, you know, perhaps now we've um, actually got to a point where we've actually had enough. And, you know, maybe this kind of video is, is actually uh, something that people are looking for. Uh, so, uh, you know, enjoy it. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, you want to leave comments, you know, please do so. Um, if you want to uh, help me get this kind of message out there, I would really appreciate it. If you would visit me uh, uh, on my website. Sorry about that. <laughs> But if you'd visit me on my website uh, at roach.com, uh, there is a donation button there. Um, if you'd like to help in other ways, there are other ways that you can help. Uh, I, I need a lot of help. I, I do this myself. And, uh, you know, of course, I had a very interesting life. And uh, uh, there are some people that are a little afraid of some of the things that I do. I mean, there's no need. Um, but uh, 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 they don't make it easy for me. So if, if you can help me, I would really sure appreciate it. So, uh, you know, sit back, uh, you know, get your your pad and a pencil out and you might want to take notes uh, there is a lot of information in this I run you through the law uh, it's similar to the cheat sheet um, the problem with the video itself is it's not much of an ego head fake so it allows ego to filter out the inf a lot of the information but if you watch it enough times you, you'll get a, a lot of the information. It, it's not as useful as, say, the uh, the cheat sheet Mark V. There, there is a specific systemic process involved, and and it, it, if you'd like to get that uh, that link, I can uh, I can show you where that's at. Um, just you know, uh, send me a message or uh, leave me a comment. I I might cr uh, leave the link in the in the video description. So, uh, with that, on with the show. The objective of this presentation is to help the viewer realize his true freedom. This is done through an altering of one's perception, which goes through three stages. The first stage is to realize that one must lose power and control to gain power and control. The second stage, where we find a lot of the enlightened people today, is that they realize they have no power and control and never had power and control in the first place. The third stage is to acknowledge and realize what does possess the power and control and permit that power and control to be expressed on our behalf and for our benefit and the benefit of those around us. This is how one realizes true freedom. And this is the objective of this presentation. The first mistake people often make is that they think the truth is something outside of us that we reveal through searching for it. The truth is not some wisdom, knowledge, or magic words found in some book or on some mountaintop. You will not find some long-haired guru who will be able to wave his hand and turn you on like a floodlight. If you learn nothing from this presentation, learn this. One does not find the truth by searching for it. The truth has its own sense of timing at its own intellect, and it controls who sees the truth and who does not, such that the truth finds them, or more accurately, help people realize that it was always right in front of their face the whole time. You can force yourself to go through this presentation, but you will not be able to pay attention. Something will distract you. You won't be able to understand the concepts, or more likely, you will not allow yourself to believe what I am saying. Don't be hard on yourself. It does not mean you are evil, wrong, stupid, or undeserving. It only means you have some more basic and important lessons to learn from your life first. Don't worry. You will get it. In time, we will all get it. Just know, all is as it should be. And when you are made ready, it will come naturally and easily. What this presentation will do is cause the viewer to think in new directions and maybe to dispel some of the fear we all carry inside of us. What I am is a man. That's all. Most of you are saying, So what? Now I am not a person. I realize that that sounds strange, but a person 
Where it really matters is not what you read in a dictionary. Under statutory law, a person is an individual commercial corporation. When you stand in front of a judge, that is how he's going to treat you. In this modern age, a person has voluntarily given away all rights that men and women enjoy. A man and woman are the second most powerful beings in this universe. A person is the least most powerful being in the universe, and if you don't believe me, then mistreat a dog in plain sight and see what happens to you. I have a constructive dialogue with the entity that really runs things in this universe. It is the most powerful being in and out of the universe. I have no guilt, no shame, obviously. I make no excuses and I do not create victims out of myself or anyone else. I am happy, carefree, but I'm starting to get bored with all the angry, sad, timid, and pathetic people around me who are so confused they don't know what to do. In my life, I have tested the boundaries of my experience in this universe to the point that the universe, on several occasions, nearly killed me as I worked to uncover a secret. I eventually figured it out. Now it's a great secret and it's worth knowing, so put away your bad assumptions, your delusions, and false conclusions. I would suggest that you give me your complete and undivided attention. It cost me a lot to figure this out. And if you know what I know, then you would want to share it also. My name is not important. Just think of me as you. If later I say man, Without saying woman also, just know I mean man and woman. I'm not sexist, I'm just lazy. The reason I'm doing this is because I love people and I do what I can to help them. Before we continue, I need to align your perspective such that you can assimilate the tool that I'm about to reveal to you. So first, we need to establish common ground so you can get closer to seeing things as I see them. If it weren't important to your understanding, I would not waste your time. I decided that reading material to yourself does not work like hearing it. Sound creates ripples and expressions of power in the universe where thoughts do not. You are not to trust what I say without independently verifying it for yourself. I am not permitted to pass this information on to you error free. It is for you to discover what is right and what is wrong. I am not going to babysit. If you are afraid or unsure, then you have no business listening to me. Perhaps you would feel happier chasing a dream or disciplining your simian. If you are in the place most of us are at, then what I'm going to tell you will make you uncomfortable. And if it is properly understood, will pull you out from where you have grounded yourself. Just know the story has a happy ending. If there are those out there that really try to understand and verify what I say here today, then you are in for some great fun and surprises. It will not be easy. Not because what I say is complicated, it is because most of what you think about this universe was not introduced to you by accident. It was designed specifically to program you to conceal from yourself what I am about to share with you. The last thing man's authority wants is a bunch of free law-abiding people wandering around here who are not confused and not afraid. What is the universe? The universe can be thought of as a virtual reality interactive game program. The Wachowskis are good folks and are trying to clue you in. Pay attention, they know what they're talking about. The universe can be thought of as a prison or a classroom. The classroom contains material elements, energies, forces, aspects, events, ideas, concepts, emotions, fictions, and entities that I will refer to as stuff. The Supreme Authority. The entity that controls all this stuff, men have called God, the Source, the One, Nature, Truth, Love, Allah, and the list is endless and equally incomplete. Understand there is just one entity and I will refer to it as the Supreme Authority. It is the Supreme Authority that all things are subordinate to. It is singular and employs control principles or rules that all stuff conforms to. We often refer to the rules 
in the physical as physics, in the unseen as metaphysics, and in the nonsensical as politics. The rules apply consistently, uniformly, and logically in these spheres of distraction, without fail. I will call this body of rules divine law, as it is under the complete control of the supreme authority, and the supreme authority is first and foremost bound to the same divine law, as they can be thought of as one and the same. We do not know the true name of this supreme authority, because to know its true name is to control it. The Supreme Authority, however, knows your and my true name. What is this thing you call me? The singularity, that is you, exists now as a student slash prisoner, or what I will call an observer. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Road. The physical part of you is merely a flesh suit you wear. The body contains a brain or an interface pool that allows the observer to see into the physical universe. It is a viewing window, nothing more. The brain creates electrical symbols that the observer can interpret. The reverse is not important as the construct we see is produced independently. We appear to see signals from the brain to the body but we have no real objective way to prove what we experience is actually there. Said another way, just because we all experience a universe does not prove objectively that the universe actually exists. All we can prove objectively is that we all experience a universe. Ask Mr. Anderson and he would say yes. Ask Neo and he would say no. The brain does not create the mind. There is only one observer and many individuated singularities. Think of it like a multifaceted crystal sphere where each facet reflects and refracts a slightly different view. Each facet is prohibited from viewing exactly what another facet views or experiencing exactly what another facet experiences. These multiple facets are lives and each life slash singularity enjoys privacy from the others and thinks it is alone in its experience. That which looks out of my eyes that I call me is the same thing that looks out of your eyes that you call me. For to be another way would ruin the experience. Think about how one being that lives in eternity could experience another being and know what it's like to feel mortal. It's a great thing to experience. How would a being go about experiencing that? Look around you. That is how it's done. The mind is universal, and our brains provide the conscious observer limited access to this vast mainframe of universal knowledge. Whether real or virtual, our senses produce feedback converted to holographic electrical symbols, imagery, and concepts to the conscious observer through the viewing tool of the brain. The physical exists only as interpreted information and does not exist as a true concrete form. We merely are convinced it is real, and our senses reinforce this illusion. One thing that can be said about our senses is that they are usually consistent from one singularity to another, given that no two singularities can see identically the same view, and provided they are paying attention properly. Our Components The observer sits at the center of experience. It is the entity playing the game and learning what it is required to learn. It is aware and conscious. The current model shows how the typical man or woman exists in the universe. The universe is perceived as outside of us. The body appears as a physical form in the universe. For most of us, what people see and know of our external character is an ego-driven persona that is largely hypnotized by what it sees in the universe. Typically, Sensory input reaches the observer through the ego filter slash interpreter and we get a distorted view. We call concepts perceived this way as fact. Facts are truth filtered through our perception. If we have allowed our perception to become distorted, then we individually argue our facts with another man's facts. If the perceptions are clear, then we will perceive the same information identically and there will be no disagreement. When pure logic is applied, both men will come to the same conclusion. This is known as being of one mind. 
I will give you tools to help you reach this stage of clarity. The ego is a defense mechanism used to protect the observer, but in the typical man, it has taken over the life experience. This is not a constructive way to exist. The ego is on autopilot in the typical man or woman and is editing the experience to protect the observer from external and self-inflicted emotional and physical trauma. It does this by repressing the bad experience and storing it in a place out of the way so the observer seldom perceives it. This ego clutter builds up, creating a barrier between the observer, the self, and the universal mind. The self is tasked with assisting the observer through the course of the game. The self contains a working manual used in the game. The self has access to all parts of the universal mind. We all share access to the universal mind and the universal self. In the Bible, the self is referred to as the Holy Spirit. Its function is to assist the observer by manifesting experience for the benefit of the observer and all those around him or her as stuff. It operates strictly in accordance with divine law. The self is your best friend and will not truly harm the observer. But remember, the body is not the observer. Pain and suffering, as well as happiness and joy, are used by the self to help guide the observer through the game. If the observer becomes so confused that there's little chance of escape during this iteration or lifetime, then they will be removed from the simulation to try again. If the self determines that the observer is not paying attention, the negative reinforcement is applied until it gains the attention of the observer. This includes, in no particular order, stress, suffering, pain, agony, disease, and finally, death. This is why we are more likely to seek relief through spirituality after a period of stress this is where real growth can take place. It is in these rare occasions where the self will break through the ego clutter and communicate with the observer directly. But it does not last long, and we seldom clear away the debris. We usually then go on piling up more garbage and doing it all over again. Eliminating the ego clutter. Ego clutter is unprocessed, uncomfortable life experiences that the observer is not able to deal with because the ego, through protecting the observer, conceals accurately this experience from the observer. When the observer does not process these lessons, they build up, creating a barrier between the observer and the self. The elements of ego clutter usually consist of painful experiences, shameful, regretful, or experiences that often cast the man or woman in a bad light. The ego tends to shift responsibility away from the observer or edits the facts relating to the incident to protect the observer. Religion uses a Satan figure in an unhealthy way to transfer blame and responsibility away from the man or woman who is actually responsible. It is not healthy to carry around unprocessed experience as the observer will find that their growth is impeded. If the observer refuses to process this ego clutter, the self will begin replaying the same experience in its life over and over until the observer learns. Each time we get the same lesson again, the ego edits and throws the experience in the memory hole. Then we are locked into living out the same lesson repeatedly and not remembering why. This clutter builds up. It gets harder and harder to process new experience and most importantly, it disconnects us from the universal self and we have far less access to the universal mind. In essence, most of us suffer from a feedback cycle that dramatically reduces our chance of success. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Road. In a healthy model, the ego sits back such that it does not interfere or filter the life experience. The ego only is used in emergency situations and any uncomfortable experience must be dealt with by the observer in a timely manner. The observer has a clear view of the universe and has full access to the help offered by the self in the form of intuition. The observer gains access to knowledge held in the universal mind. The rules or divine law is also accessible and available when the ego is returned to its proper place. When we relate to others, 
We deal with them from a self-centric or honest way, not an egocentric or theatrical way. What is the objective of the game we are in? You first are supposed to learn what you are, where you are, and realize that you are confined. Ideally, your parents were supposed to teach you, but they probably don't know yet either, because their parents didn't know. This has been going on for millennia. You are not ready, as a being, to join a responsible community because you are just starting out, and you have no business being in a community where absolute trust is a given and violating one's rights is not permitted. Until you learn and master this, then you will have to stay and repeat the grade until you master it. Only then will you be allowed to leave once your current life ends. You are to use the tools that you've been given to figure out how to escape. Most do not know they've been confined or that they need to get out. They cannot detect it because their perception conceals this from them and their ego makes it all better. Instead, they waste their time chasing their dreams or living the American dream or some nonsense like that. If when your time ends here, in your current lifetime, you will either be reborn to do it all over again or you go on to better things as a graduate of this classroom. Don't worry, you have an eternity of misery to get it right. You are an observer playing the great prison break learning game. Suicide will not allow you to escape. It will, however, allow you to try again and may be harder for you the next time. Suicide again? Do it as often as you like. Pretty soon you'll get bored with spending most of your time in diapers covered in your own feces and actually try to apply yourself. You have no choice, really. And it makes no sense fumbling the kickoff return and sustaining a 15-yard penalty. You are here because, up to now, you have not figured out how to get out of the classroom or the prison. Remember, it is fun. You can lose your life, but that is not the end. The tool. You have a body in whatever shape. The particulars of that body make no difference. You will find that intellect is more of a burden than a benefit. Beauty is a distraction. In this game, being slow and unattractive is a plus. That is, if you realize it's a game. You have the self. It is an agent that works for you and feeds you information to help you get to and through the lessons you need to learn. It sets up the learning scenarios and life lessons cooperatively with other players who are also playing the game. Oh, and here's a hint. Cut the other players a break. They are in the same game you are and blowing it same as you. Through the self, you learn the law and can know what will help you and what will set you back. Here's another hint. Lying is not helping you, regardless if you are ignorant of what you are saying is not the truth. You have a conscience. It is a compass that tells you what is constructive and what is a hindrance. Ignore it at your own peril. When you really blow it, it can be taken away, and it is really hard to get back. You have all the stuff in the universe. Don't try to own it. It is school property, and it is only on loan. The stuff is a learning aid, along with this little principle called cause and consequence. Use it in your experiments. If you try to collect the stuff, it tends to become a burden that you have to carry around with you. Pack light. If you happen to see a weapon lying around, just leave it there for other players to find. You won't need it. They are usually used for negative reinforcement. The rules. Up until now, you probably did not know you were in a game, and you took at face value what the rules are, and you learned this from others who did not have the foggiest clue where they are or what they are. Do not trust what you trust. Throw out the old rules and experiment to figure out exactly what the rules are. Literature, history, science, religion, psychology, philosophy, etc. are all devised by confused people and some are put there on purpose to confuse you just to make the game interesting. It is best just to toss it all out and start from scratch. Some have made it their objective to never graduate and only try to exploit the confused to make their stay in jail more comfortable. They are allowed to do this because it makes for a better and more challenging game. You have been given tools. The most important is the how-to and help manual. It is hidden within you. 
in the part we call the self. Again, the Bible calls this thing the Holy Spirit. The self is part of the supreme authority. There is just one self. The flesh robots and the conscious observer all share this one self and one mind. Each sees their individual part of the self and mind. Everything is permissible. Some actions help and work towards escaping, and some actions hurt, delaying your departure. Use the manual and ask the self to identify which is which before you go putting your hand on the red hot stove. Learn each lesson. If you get good at it, you will put your hand on the stove once. If you are not paying attention, you will do it over again, and it will hurt more. A wise man once said to me, Hey, idiot, quit walking on my grass. Since it was his grass, and powers expressed on his behalf to defend it, I did not walk on his grass again, and he did not have to say it to me again. If I continued to walk on his grass, he would have kicked my butt. I avoided that consequence by paying attention to the warning instead of ignoring it. You parents know that if you tell your two-year-old, Thou shalt not put your hand on the red-hot stove, and you turn your head, what happens? A better way to phrase it is this. If you put your hand on the red-hot stove, it will burn you, and it will hurt real bad. The smart ones will heed the warning. The real smart ones will test to see if you are telling the truth. Now, if you really blow it, you might have to spend a lifetime as a dog who gets abandoned by their owner at the city park. You will be left to sit there, starving to death, walking up to people, endlessly trying to find the scumbag who deserted you. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Road. Now, there have been some changes to the game recently. As you probably notice, there are a lot of us playing the game, or not playing, <laughs> truth be known. This is because so few are getting out that it's creating a backlog. If we have a major disaster that kills a bunch of us off, say, five billion, can you imagine what the wait times will be to get back in? The Supreme Authority found it necessary to finally reveal the fast track tool that has, up till now, been allowed to be held in secret by the folks who don't want to ever leave. To correct this situation, several folks like me have been dragged to some serious clue and given a great tool to make things easier. If you have asked the Supreme Authority to make this your last lifetime, then you probably already know what I'm talking about. It is best to make sure. I was given this tool not because I am special or moral or chosen. I was given the tool only because I asked and expected an answer. Because I was such a reprobate, it is part of my job to share this tool with as many of you as are ready to receive it. The Supreme Authority has already picked a bunch of you out. This tool will help clear out the excess population and make the game more productive and useful. Miracling your butts out of here is not an option, as it violates the divine law. This tool has been around a long time. We know the name of it. We know what it does. We until now do not know what it is or how to get it. The tool is called the Holy Grail. What is the Holy Grail? We are told it is a cup or a bloodline. We know it involves kings and royalty. We know it is how you get divine grace and protection. We know it is somehow related to these characters called Jesus Christ and King Arthur. John Borman did a movie about a sword called Excalibur where the Grail made a cameo appearance and Indiana Jones had to jump through a bunch of hoops to get it. The Da Vinci Code was about the bloodline of kings that were said to be direct descendants of Jesus Christ. We know the grail is hard to find. Those that sit at the top are working hard to keep it from us. The term sovereignty comes up a lot. We have to be worthy, whatever that means. What we get is bits and pieces and none of this pap contains sufficient truth to help us in any way. That is not an accident. In fact, all this fiction was designed specifically to make it real difficult to discover the secret. I believe the proper euphemisms are a wild goose chase or a snipe hunt. I did not find it because I was looking for it. 
I was trying to understand real law. Real law, and not this law that men come up with. For instance, man can write a law abolishing gravity. Do you think that law is enforceable? I wanted to know what made law enforceable. I wanted to know how power is expressed without the magical mumbo jumbo. This was because what I saw in the universe did not make sense to me. I don't think. I'm alone in this. I studied the U.S. Constitution and thought it was a good idea. I just did not understand why we weren't using it anymore. In watching a video about the Constitution, the instructor taught me what a real contract actually is and how they were enforced. I will go into that later because it is important. I stumbled on these folks who call themselves sovereigns, but I could not really figure out what the word really meant because the definitions I found were real vague. The Pope was sovereign. Uh, kings and queens were known as sovereigns. There were sovereign countries and gold money called sovereigns. When I stumbled on what it really meant, it was like falling off the edge of the universe. The Holy Grail is divine law that allows a man to be a real king. It allows a woman to be a real queen, or what is known as a sovereign. You have to be ready even to be able to hear and understand this law. If you are watching this, and it is making sense to you, and you are not yet bored out of your skull, then you are ready. If you think it's an accident, luck, or chance that you are watching this, then guess again. The Holy Grail Law. To be a sovereign, you have to know what a sovereign man or woman is. You have to know what responsibilities and obligations a sovereign has to himself, others, and most importantly, to the supreme authority. You have to know how sovereignty is granted and what does the granting. You have to know what a sovereign is giving up and will not be able to do. You have to know what a sovereign gets in exchange and what he will be able to do. You have to know the law required to maintain and protect one's sovereignty, and you have to ask, and you have to know who to ask to be granted one's sovereignty. A sovereign is a king or queen, and they answer to no one but the supreme authority, and they are not subject to the will or power of another man, woman, group, idea, or concept. A sovereign takes full responsibility for everything they have done, and understands that everything that happened and will happen to them is their fault alone. That's right. No more being a victim. No more blaming your parents. No more blaming society. No more blaming anyone for your problems except your own self. If you got anything from before in this program, you would already know that the self is what generates your life experience. Got it? If you want to blame others for your problems, go right ahead. Things will not get better for you. They will get worse. The supreme authority is ready when you are. But in case you haven't been keeping up with the news, it's almost World War Three o'clock, and they'll probably be turning the internet off soon, so you might want to suck it up. You might be doing the whole running for your life thing real soon. One thing for sure, you won't have any but Jesus in you, because it'll all be scared out of you. In salesman speak, that is creating a need and a sense of urgency. There are some things a sovereign cannot do when they get the Holy Grail, and you need to know what you're giving up and be willing to give it up before you get the prize. A sovereign is not allowed to create a victim of himself, others, and the supreme authority. A sovereign cannot worship false gods. If you are religious, then you're probably worshiping a false god. They rigged it that way on purpose, so you can't ever figure it out. You have to split the program to see clearly. That, by itself, guarantees that most of you will stop watching right now and begin preparing yourself for all the suffering that's coming. They promised you that, and they are going to deliver. Think you're one of the 144,000? If you think that, I have a life of slavery to sell you, and I'll throw in some maiming, raping, disease, and torture for free. A sovereign cannot create a victim through a lie, even accidentally, or in ignorance. They speak the truth unless they are joking, and you will know when they are joking. No murdering, no stealing. I will let you figure out which of the others are actually enforced. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Rogue.
The reason a sovereign cannot do these things is because when you create a victim, power is marshaled against you on the behalf of your victim in the form of consequences like imprisonment. What good is a king when he's in jail or hanging from a rope? A violation of divine law first leads to confusion and a disconnection from the supreme authority. Since power flows to the sovereign from the supreme authority, any disconnections is a career ender. How does one refrain from creating an accidental victim? Divine grace and protection, and I will show you how to put that tool in place a little later. A sovereign is not permitted to place anything between him and the supreme authority, and that means no king, no government, no fiction, no false god, no man, woman, or agency. What does a sovereign get in exchange? A sovereign gets new cleaned out senses that allow him to perceive the world around them accurately without any ego interference. A sovereign is altered such that they are able to understand the images and communication that the supreme authority uses to speak to man. Human language is not always an effective means of communication, often because it is too vague and ambiguous and prone to misinterpretation. See Bible. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Roach, you're telling me that the Supreme Authority is talking to you? Have you lost your mind? Well, it wasn't like the Supreme Authority just started communicating with me. I just simply realized that the Supreme Authority had been communicating with me all along and how this was done. The Supreme Authority doesn't talk to me, it talks through me. And what that means is, the Supreme Authority speaks using my voice out loud and the voice I use to think to myself in my head. If you're hearing a different voice, then something else is going on. Now, most people think, oh, well, these are my thoughts, they come from me. Well, no. Remember, the self generates the experience. The self is what's feeding this. If you think that your thoughts, ideas, and emotions percolate up from a primitive reptilian brain, you have to ask yourself, how did Einstein and Tesla figure out these complex things? Do you actually think a primitive reptile hindbrain was what was feeding these guys their inspiration? No way! Or at least I can't believe it. I mean, if you want to believe it, hey, have fun! And the way this works is this. I begin talking, and all of a sudden, I notice if I just relax and trust, the words that come to my lips do not originate from me, and I don't have to think about speaking them. Similarly, when I'm thinking to myself in my mind, if I just relax, they'll take on a mind of their own, and all I need to do is just simply pay attention. Not only that, but I've got the entire universe at my disposal. Everything becomes a message. If I'm paying attention, numbers, colors, people out there uh, are speaking to me, and if I listen carefully, they're telling me an interesting story. Now, they don't even have to be conscious that they're doing this. Not all of the stuff that I'm getting is information. Not all of it is the truth. A whole lot of it is not the truth. So how do I know what's the truth and what's not the truth? It comes down to my unconditional trust of the supreme authority. Now, when somebody is speaking to me, the stuff that resonates as truth is highlighted. The stuff that is not, I, I don't retain, and I, I'm not able to listen. It sort of gets filtered out like static. Also, the words oftentimes are ambiguous. So I need help understanding in which way what they're saying is actually the truth. So I need the actual definition in order to understand which of the ambiguous terms or definitions of the words that are used in dialogue and in books and when I'm thinking to myself, I need help. I get that help. I know which definition is the one that I need to retain. It comes automatically. That is if I relax and let it happen. Now I also get images. I also get these things that people call visions. They're very vivid imagery. They have a very important meaning. And if I research that meaning, or if I don't understand, I can simply look in my experience and throughout the day, that imagery will actually be defined through concrete experience. Now you have to ask to be shown these things. If you don't ask, it's not forced down your throat. You have to be willing. And if you're willing and you ask, you'll start seeing these things in your daily lives. 
When you start reading books, the same thing applies. The stuff that's the truth will stick out, and there will be no ambiguity in the terms because those will be defined for you. Why? Because you're not trusting what you're reading. You're trusting the supreme authority. And it's through that connection that you get the accurate, truthful meaning of what's being presented to you. Now, most people don't understand that. However, there are people high up in the clergy that already understand this principle. They know when they read scripture that they have to have that connection. Otherwise, it's just an academic exercise. And that academic exercise will often lead you to believe in something that's deception. And it's your own fault, because if you give place to that, you only have yourself to blame. Now, understand that these things are lessons, but you shouldn't be doing these things over and over again. Learn the lesson once. A sovereign sees coincidence as purpose irony as just and deserving consequence and they get to know how and why the stuff in their lives does what it does a sovereign does not need to subject him or herself to the will of another a sovereign is educated to the divine law and it flows from his mouth and comes to his lips exactly when he or she needs it all unprocessed life experience or ego clutter is reviewed one by one and the sovereign is taught why the experience happened, what was the good lesson learned, and why it was a good thing. A sovereign is able to now look back fondly at the most heinous experience and see the good in it. This relieves the burden of these loose ends, hang-ups, phobias, etc., such that he becomes unencumbered and feels lighter. That is, enlightenment or to feel lighter and unburdened, not glowing like a projector bulb. Imagine how hard it would be to sleep if you were glowing. The sovereign is then free to play the game at an accelerated pace and learn at a mind-boggling rate. A sovereign will not suffer by betrayal or deception. A sovereign does things automatically. A sovereign's wants are aligned with their needs, such that merely doing what they want is exactly what they need. In speaking the truth, a sovereign wields a weapon more powerful than any devised by man and can instill immediate terror in the confused and morally feeble. Sovereigns do not relate to others through the pretense of egos and are able to cut directly to the self, thereby knowing the good in the men and women around them immediately. Life becomes fun and easy. The Divine Law of Contract Why? Is it important that a sovereign understand the divine law of contract? Because the easiest way to deprive oneself of sovereignty is to ignorantly give it away by binding their sovereignty away through the creation of an enforceable contract. Those who would have us as their slaves are fully aware of this principle. What are the parts to a real contract? All real enforceable contracts must contain the following. Enforceable means power will be used in its execution and the binding to terms. Said a different way, the supreme authority moves the universe to make it happen, or the parties suffer consequences if they fail to meet their obligations. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Road. What are the parts to a real contract? All real enforceable contracts must contain the following. Enforceable means power will be used in its execution, and the binding to terms. Said a different way, the supreme authority moves the universe to make it happen, or the parties suffer consequences if they fail to meet their obligations. An enforceable real contract must contain an offer, one has to first solicit, an acceptance, another has to accept the offer, an exchange of real consideration. One does something if another does something else. Real consideration means real labor, real property, and real money. Fiat paper currency cannot be used as consideration in an enforceable real contract. An enforceable real contract must contain a meeting of the minds. A contract must be between two minds. A piece of paper is only documentation and by itself is not a contract, even though many say that it is. This is important to realize, 
And I will go into that when I tell you what is enforceable under divine law and by the supreme authority. Real enforcement of contracts are treated as follows. All contracts are verbal, with one important exception, which I will go into later. A party's word is their bond. What holds the parties to the terms? That's right. The only thing that can. The supreme authority. If one breaks their word, then it becomes a bond or shackle. A man or woman has the unlimited right to contract. A man cannot be compelled to relinquish his right, but can, through confusion, be tricked into voluntarily relinquishing his rights, or be enslaved. All contracts are voluntary. A man cannot be forced into a contract. A forced agreement will be ignored by the supreme authority, and no power will be marshaled to enforce the terms. All contracts are buyer beware, or caveat emptor. A man is responsible for knowing what he is getting himself into. The party to a real contract must have the reasonable means to discover the terms and conditions of the contract. If you make assumptions without trying to clarify the terms, then you are bound. However, this concept has been criminally exploited. Much of the law we encounter, we falsely believe, applies to man, woman, or people. What was done, after the contract was made, was to redefine the terms. A person, as defined in law, is not a man, and colorable law cannot be made to apply to a man unless the man is ignorant. The contract is therefore null and void for two reasons. The language is intentionally deceptive, and the application and conditions were modified ex post facto or after the fact. Under law, if the parties begin acting like a contract is in force, then it is presumed a contract indeed exists. If you act like you're bound to a contract, the supreme authority treats it as if you were bound to a contract. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, looks like a duck, then it is a duck. This is the exception that I talked about before. Nothing verbal has to transpire between the two parties. If they begin performing as if a contract exists, then it will be treated as if a contract exists. What's important also is that one understands what contracts, or more accurately, fictions, do not carry divine force of law and that is a contract of color. Color means fiction, or something that exists only in the minds of men. Literally, a fictional contract, because it carries no force in divine law. Now we have been sold this nonsense on purpose. We falsely believe we are bound to this witchcraft, and because we do not know any better, we act in performance of the terms. Why would we give power to a thing that has no power? While we have become tangled in this fiction, the folks at the top use real law to trick us into binding ourselves to real contract. For instance, when you sign a credit card receipt, whom do you have the contract with? Could Mr. or Mrs. Walmart please come over here and shake my hand? The corporation exists only in the people's minds. People act like it's real. Without those people and that thought in their minds, it has no power. It has no mind of its own, and a man cannot make a real contract with it. Any man who claims to represent a fiction commits a fraud. Why? Because we have no way of knowing if Mr. or Mrs. Walmart actually gave his or her permission to do so. The burden of proof is on them, because until Mr. or Mrs. Walmart says so, these so-called representatives can prove nothing. The enforceable contract does not exist, we are just too stupid to know any better. Understanding real consideration is important. It must be real, or it is not enforceable under divine law. Paper money is a promise to pay. It has no inherent value. It consists of someone ignorantly feeling that they have an obligation. It is not real, so if paper-based money is used in a contract, then the entire contract becomes colorable, and therefore not enforceable under divine law. Man has become very skilled in tricking people into falling for this ruse. They invent these contracts, include implied terms, and invent fictions who have been injured by our refusal to meet terms. We have no reasonable way of discovering these monstrosities of witchcraft or their terms, so they are not enforceable under divine law. 
It is only our ignorance of divine law that allows this nonsense to continue. Let me give you an example of how this principle works. I watched a video by John Harris called It's an Illusion on BBC5. And if you haven't seen it, you might pick it up. Now, I'll caution you that this particular broadcast did not bring the viewer to the stage three part of the consciousness paradigm. He did a very good job of explaining the creation of a fictional corporation or a person through the birth certificate document. Now at the end, he suggested that we must all gain control of this piece of paper such that we could be free. The danger here is that a piece of paper does not make you a slave. You make you a slave. Now understand, it is a violation for one man to control another man as a slave. It's also a violation for a man to put himself in the position of being a slave. Both men suffer consequences in this relationship. Now the perpetuation of this slavery is not the fault of the master. It is the fault of the slave. See, the slave would not be a slave if he wouldn't have violated rule one, and that is, have no other God before me. The slave builds up animosity and begins to resent his master and many times wants to get even or cause his master harm. This perpetuates his slavery because he shifts the blame away from himself to the master. It is not the master's fault that he has become enslaved. It's his own fault that he's become enslaved. And while he harbors this animosity, he will remain a slave. Once he forgives his master, then he understands that, hey, his slavery was due to his own errors of judgment. Now, once he comes to this realization, he will have an opportunity to either be released outright by his master or given an opportunity to simply walk away. In this way, John Harris is still wrestling with the idea of a piece of paper binding him to contract. There isn't a party on the other side that has the power to enforce it. So therefore, the supreme authority only honors that contract out of our own ignorance. Once you remedy the ignorance, the power goes away. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Road. Now you need to cut the judges a break here. They try, and in most cases, they succeed in being fair arbiters of the law. They are neutral. So if you are ignorant of the law, it is because the supreme authority is allowing you to be ignorant. If the judge attempts to reveal the law to either party in a conflict, then it is the judge who is on the wrong side of divine law. However, my problem with judges is they do not sit on the bench all the time. They have sworn an oath not to ever teach a man the law. To act as an honest broker, we need to know if the judge is operating with a conflict, and we must know if he indeed knows the law. Outside of court, he should be out demonstrating that fitness and helping others out of the fictional morass instead of clamming up and leaving everyone twisting in the wind. The oath to never reveal the law outside of their duty as a judge creates victims and therefore runs afoul of divine law. I know for a fact there are many judges out there who welcome men and women who understand the law into their court. And in fact, you will find no greater advocate for your position than a judge who realizes that you know the law. However, you're required to demonstrate to the judge that you understand divine law. Even better, if you do understand the principles that I teach here, you will never have a need to come before an arbiter to settle any kind of disagreement. Why? Because you will never be able to create a victim. So therefore, there will be no conflict. Also, with regard to banks and creditors, they already understand that they have no real divine force in any of these fictional contracts that they bandy about. And when you refuse to pay or terminate the relationship, and can demonstrate to them very clearly of your understanding of divine law, oftentimes their legal department will advise them just to leave you alone. If they suspect that you don't understand divine law, they may press the issue. It is your responsibility 
to notify them properly of your acute understanding of divine law such that they can know unequivocally that you are in full control of your own property. Here are some other things that a sovereign needs to understand. The created is never more powerful than its creator. I am a man. I create fiction. Fiction is not more powerful than I. I have the power to walk away any time I choose. The supreme authority created me. It has the power to walk away from me <laughs> whenever it so chooses. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you have a constructive relationship with the supreme authority, then you will have the divine law when you need it. Those who are not in possession of their faculties or have turned away from the supreme authority are, under divine law, to be judged incompetent and subject to the prevailing authority. They cannot be held to the terms of any real contract. They have no power and are at the mercy and compassion of others. Unfortunately, in our case, those others could care less if the incompetent live or die. Another principle that a sovereign must be aware of is that if one asks permission, it's assumed under divine law and by the supreme authority that they need permission. We have been conditioned to voluntarily submit to authority. We see a man in a uniform and we just bend right over. Now the supreme authority honors our wish and is more than happy to put that authority over us when we choose to. Why? Because we violate rule one once again. And this is another way a sovereign deprives themselves of their sovereignty. Let's take it one step further. We each have within us an interface that allows things to be transferred from what is called the subconscious to our conscious minds. It is the means by which our behaviors, thoughts, emotions, and ideas can be modified behind the scenes and introduced as behaviors in our experience. This process we know of as hypnosis. When a person is hypnotized, all manner of thoughts, behaviors, ideas, and even false memories can be introduced into our subconscious such that our conscious minds cannot determine the source of these memories, ideas, thoughts, and emotions. Some people cannot be hypnotized, and the reason why is because they do not trust the hypnotist. This is a very important thing to understand. The hypnotist has no power unless the person being hypnotized trusts them without condition. It's only then the hypnotist gains access to this interface and can introduce this stuff into the hypnotized person's mind. In this way, anytime we place trust in anything, be it a man, an idea, a concept, a piece of paper, or anything in the universe, we can become hypnotized by it. Why? Because if we trust the source without condition, they can introduce these things into our subconscious and they become real in our consciousness and we are unable to distinguish where these thoughts and ideas come from. It's very important where one places their trust. If it's not placed only in the supreme authority, then we leave ourselves open to introduce all sorts of nonsense into our behavior and we are unable to discover the source of this aberration. Anytime we place trust in something that is not the supreme authority, we become hypnotized by that information. It's a very important thing to understand. Many people are hypnotized. For instance, if you trust your teacher and she hands you a book and says, read this, it's the truth, and you trust her that what you read is the truth, then it becomes assimilated as part of you. The book itself could be absolute nonsense. Now what you've done is introduced absolute nonsense into your experience. You're often the only person that's subject to that nonsense and you're the one that pays the price. So be mindful where you place your trust. This is the reason I tell you not to trust me. Your trust is not well placed with me. However, your trust is well placed with the supreme authority and in that way you can be protected from any kind of nonsense that is introduced into your environment. Now you have to understand you carry these things around with you. One by one, you're going to have to untie them and test which assumptions that you hold as truth.
are indeed the truth. If you're able to do this one by one, eventually you will arrive in a completely different perceptual model. Now some time back, I mentioned how lies are not helping you, and I'd like to go into that a little further. There is a concept in law that's understood as the truth reigns supreme. It's also related to trial by combat. This is also related to muscle testing and why muscle testing works. Trial by combat, or truth reigns supreme, is based on the principle that a knight who is false cannot prevail in single combat. Now, the reason this works is the self tries to bring the truth to the observer. The self is collective. Between two men who have some sort of conflict, one of them is in the right and one of them is in the wrong, often. And when they meet, they go to trial. You have an independent arbiter that we know of as a judge, and he oversees the combat. Now, in the old days, during the days of chivalry, they would just go out there and hack one another to death with a sword. The knight that won was true, the other one was false. Now what happens is, is the same as in muscle testing. When it's false, the self transmits weakness to the body. If it's true, the body remains strong. So when you're in conflict between these two, the strong one has the power. Now this is done simply to demonstrate who was right. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Road. We are now more civilized, and we match wits instead. I want to make a distinction between a court of law and an administrative court. A court of law is where one matches wits, facing another in court as a man. Administrative court is akin to playing imaginary navy. When you walk into the courtroom, the judge is captain of an imaginary ship. That ship is that little gated area. Now he's the captain, and under maritime law, he is king of his country. He doesn't even have to listen to you. Now, we don't know the difference between that, and there's better places to actually get this information, but you have to understand that all is fair in fiction, and when you step onto his imaginary boat, he assumes that you want to play imaginary navy with him. And then, of course, things usually go wrong for you. But this weakness that we get when we deceive or if we hold a idea that's not accurate is really a threat and will really hurt us in our experience. Now, If you ever notice the bullies always say come on hit me. See the bully may or may not understand this but if the other guy hits him first then he gets the power to retaliate and he wins. What we need to do is go back to when we were kindergarten and we used to say sticks and stones may break my bones but words can never hurt me. Because the second you start reacting in a violent way, that puts you on the wrong side of divine law and you give power away to your victim. Doesn't matter who that victim is, could be a bully, if he's just simply taunting you, he hasn't assaulted you yet. Now be careful, there's a lot of these so-called purveyors of truth on the internet. Realize that they're trying to provoke a violent action such that those that would have us as their slaves could then react to us. We should never think to actually give them that power. And if we do give that power, they get the power over us. This occurs on a larger scale with armed military conflicts between sovereign nations. Now Sun Tzu, a long time ago, at least 2,000 years, said he could predict which general would win by the general who has the highest moral authority. Now, where's this moral come from? Well, it's where we get the word morale. When you become separated from the divine authority, you become demoralized, and you start running afoul of divine law, or at least finding yourself on the wrong side of it. When you do that, you cannot prevail in battle. And we're seeing this play out in the world today. However, one must know that most of modern warfare now is not man on man, it's person on person. And all of these persons have bound away their sovereignty. And those that are their masters can do with them as they see fit. Before one can be sovereign, they must know this law. Simply reading 
or hearing it does not count. They must be willing to give up what's required and take full responsibility for what is granted. You must know the law before any of the magic starts. No excuses. To be sovereign means that you truly, in your heart, want to be sovereign. To be sovereign, you must ask in a clear and audible voice to be granted your sovereignty. The last piece is very important. It is what allows one to receive the divine grace and protection. Sovereignty itself is granted through contract between a man and the mind of the supreme authority, and is enforced under divine law. This is why a sovereign, in order to be sovereign, must first know the laws of contract and the divine law. The supreme authority is not like a man. It will not try to get one over on you. You will not be forced, even if you say you want to be sovereign. The supreme authority knows your heart. When you request it to be granted, you will be notified that it has been granted. It requires a meeting of the minds, yours and the supreme authority. Some of the people who have done this have completely freaked out when they realize the truth and the supreme authority made its presence known to them. I will tell you, it can be the most profound, humbling, and terrifying event that will ever happen in your life. You will not have any doubt whatsoever. I did not have the benefit of someone coaching me. And when it happened to me, I said to myself, Holy shit, what have I done? How in the world can I ever hope to protect myself from my own idiotic tendency? I'm not that strong. And I didn't have that kind of mental discipline. When you meet the supreme authority, you, like me, will not want to disappoint. The second, that lack of protection, came to my mind, this contract offer came to my lips automatically. I will trust you without condition if you remove from me my ability to create a victim. I know it is not automatic for everyone. The supreme authority was my coach, so I got a break. Study the contract. Know it by heart. Practice it and think about why it works before you even think to ask for your sovereignty to be granted. All my ego clutter was cleared out, and now I cannot create a victim. I can exist right in front of you, and you cannot even tell. I was able to go through everything that happened to me in my life with perfect clarity, and all that burdensome junk was lifted away. I was enlightened because I had nothing pulling me down. I was light as a feather. I have no fear, no worry, and I'm truly happy. I was educated to divine law. And simply by applying these simple rules, I can know why these things happened in my life. The only mystery is the wonderful surprises that occur every single day. You do not have to trust me. Please don't. Figure it out for yourself. The supreme authority is fair and logical and would never force you to do anything against your will. If you do not like it, you can always go back to the old way. Try it and see what happens. You meet the supreme authority. Then it gets real good, real fast. Why does religion not teach this law? Well, think about it. If everyone were walking around free with a continual and constructive dialogue with the supreme authority, then why would we need religion? Religion is one of the primary ways they keep us shackled. They are going to hate me for that, but what can they do against the supreme authority? They can't stop me, but they may try to keep you from figuring it out. If any of them say this does not work, then they lie. I am now free to play the game as it was intended. The Satan character? I've never actually met him personally, and I've looked, but he does not and cannot exist in the place I currently reside. True freedom is only attained when we realize that we do not have the power or control over another man, so therefore they do not have the power or control over us. It is pure equality. It is freedom. I love this game. I mean, I really love this game. Road.